Football is a game of two sexes. It's 2016, the wrecking ball is approaching, and Ashley, Brittany and Heather must face up to the destruction of their beloved football club. As the demolition company moves in, the girls stage a last-ditch protest to save their club and fight for what they believe in. Girls with Balls is a new play. It is inspired by real-life events from 1921, when the Football Association banned women from playing football at its affiliated grounds. After 50 years of hurt, the ban was finally lifted in 1971. Tackling football and feminism head-on, Girls with Balls takes a bold look at women, men and the beautiful game. I'm joined in the studio by Rosalind Patterson, who stars in the show. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. Tell us about your acting journey. Um, I've always performed. I've always been a performer, although it started when I was very young and I started dancing. Mm. It wasn't until my kind of early teens that I started acting in amateur companies in my town in Scotland. I then went on to study at college. I did acting and performance at college and then was given a place at the Academy of Live and Recorded Arts in London, where I did my, my honours for three years. So I studied there from 2009 until 2012. And from then, I've just been out in the big bad world of acting. Fantastic. Yeah. And you're from Scotland? I am. I'm from just outside Glasgow. I understand, uh, obviously, you're a classy football fan. You support Glasgow Celtic, <laughs> just like myself. I do. I do. Um, I don't, I'm not a massive football fan, but if I'm to choose a team, I'd probably say Glasgow Celtic would be well, the one. You can't be far off uh, if you support Glasgow Celtic. No, I, I, think, I think I'm on the right track. Okay. Going back to this production, um, yeah. it's obviously causing waves and there's a lot of debate and discussion being promoted through uh, what you are performing on stage. Now, do you think that this has a modern message? I definitely do. I think what we're trying to say in this play is that we're still in a very patriarchal society and that sexism is still very prevalent in day-to-day -day life. What we've done is we've used the story of Dick Care Ladies back from, um, in the 1920s as a prime example of how women have been affected by these sexist decisions. Um, yeah, so it's, it's definitely something that will speak to the audience today as well because I'm sure everyone comes up against some sort of sexism in their everyday life. Absolutely. Now, it's fascinating, you, uh, the characters that you play within the show. Yeah. So you play a female called Brittany. Tell us a little bit about us, I about her. I do. Brittany is a very, very fun character to play. She is ferocious and she's very loyal to her friends. I find Brittany quite sad because she seems to have lost a lot of control of her life in terms of her work and her family life and football is really where she gets her release and she gets to come into her own. Um, during the play her actions I think are her trying to get back a bit of that control that she's lost in her life. They're maybe not the right actions to take as the, the audiences who come and see the play will find out but it certainly speaks volumes about having control over your own life as a female. So she does get them into a lot of trouble through what she does, but I think it's worth it for her. So you play Britney Styles. I do. And you also play um, Alice Kell. Who is yes. she? Yes. Alice Kell, so all the characters in the 1920s are real people. So there are three girls. There's Alice Kell, Lily Parr and Florrie Redford who worked in the Dick Care munitions factories and played for Dick Care ladies. And then there's Alfred Franklin, who managed the team and also worked in the factory. So they were the, the biggest team in female football up until 1921. They played some amazing games. They beat a lot of men's teams. I think the, the team started because the female team in the factory beat the male team. Amazing. And they decided that they should run with this. They should do something about it because these girls were brilliantly talented in the game. And L Lily Parr, she was the superstar of the day, wasn't she? She was. I believe that she, with a strike, broke another player's arm at one point. 
So she was, they were all powerful, powerful players, like real athletes. It's just a shame that they didn't get to continue that. Taking into consideration that the footballs during that period were heavier, and if they became rain soaked, for example, they became yeah, even yeah, heavier. Yeah, yeah. You know, we hear stories of some of the horror stories of some football players who suffered neck injuries, like, you know, or it affected their mental health because of constant heading of, of, of a heavy ball, especially yeah. when it was, you know, rain soaked, etc. To break someone's arm, she must have had a cannonball yes. shot. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's why she, she's kind of held up there as one of the stars of that time. The star of that time, actually, I would say. So as I mentioned in my introduction very briefly, the play is inspired by a real known fact, isn't it? Yes. With the Football Association banning yes. women from football. And it's taken, do you, do you feel that having a gap of 50 years, it has, you know, stopped the development of the women's game? It would have been, should we say, a lot more developed now in the modern day if it hadn't been for such a... Absolutely. I think at the stage that they were at when the ban came in, so compared to men's football, the, female, their, the females' teams were getting... 53,000 spectators to come and see their games. That was their, their game at Goodison Park. 53,000 came to see it. 15,000 were locked out. The men's games were getting the tiniest amount of spectators turning up at the doors. So to shut them down at that point, I think there's no way that we can even start to imagine what football would be today had they been allowed to continue for those 50 years. I think it would be completely different. It certainly wouldn't be known as the man's game, mm. definitely. Um, yeah, you, you, you just can't imagine. Would it, be, would it be known as the women's game? Would it be a sport where men and women played together? It could have been any of those, but... Possibilities because are endless. Of, because of the ban that the FA brought in, we won't ever really know, and I don't think that female football will ever get back to that point again, where they are so highly thought of, right. which is a shame, a terrible shame. Can you give us a brief summary and synopsis of the play? I can. So the play is split between 2016, present day, and the 1920s. In the present day scenes of the play, the three girls are protesting the redevelopment of their football ground that's going to be turned into a shopping centre. So they've come in to have a protest, they've got a banner, they're going to sing some songs, make some speeches. Maybe not to have any impact on the football ground being knocked down, but at least to give it the farewell that they think it deserves. It means sure. an awful lot to them. And they are interrupted by a man who is very sexist and very set in his ways. And they as I mentioned earlier, they take a stand against him, they take control back. I don't want to spoil too much about it. Then there is sure. a knife involved. There is a lot of power play and it is very funny, it's very exciting. And that's it's off the field power play. Yes, <laughs> yes, definitely, definitely. Um, so it's, it's about their journey through from making these snap decisions and trying to take back some of the power that they do deserve, they get themselves into quite a bit of bother. In the 1920s, it is the story of the girls in the factory playing for their team, Dick Care Ladies, and we get to see the moment where the ban comes in and how that affects the girls, how that affects them financially, how that mm -hmm. affects them socially, um, which is really heartbreaking when you see these women who have worked so hard to get themselves to where they are and it is the rugs pulled from underneath them. So it, it's, very, it's very sad. So, so it goes sad. back and forth. You've got some very interesting facts to learn about female football over history. And then you've also got this frenzy of panic and struggle in the modern day scenes. It's wonderful. Why did you choose a role? I... I saw the spec for this show in January, I think, of this year, it must have been. And I read, the, I read a quick blurb and I just fell in love with the whole thing mm. immediately. I immediately emailed Gary Philpott, who's our director, 
who sent me over the script to read. I, it was just so many things. It was funny, it was interesting. We all sat down, when we all sat down to read the play, we learned so much about the history of women's football that we just didn't know. I don't think many people know that any of this ever happened. And I loved Brittany's character. I could connect with her. I could understand why she was doing the things she was doing. But it's all put across in a very fun and engaging way. So it seemed like a brilliant challenge and a brilliant opportunity for me as an actress to go on and do. Who, acts, who else acts on set with you? So, as well as myself, we have Daisy Morris, who plays Lily Parr with her, her strong kick. And she also plays Ashley. Then we have Ellen Gale Harewood, who plays Florrie Redford and Heather. And we have Johnny Kinch, who's come in to play the man okay. in the modern day. And he plays Alfred Franklin. Great stuff. So there's three girls and one boy. You've touched on this already, but does the production have a modern day message? It certainly does. We sat down at the, the very beginning of rehearsals and talked about everyday sexism because we wanted to get a feel for what the girls thought about sexism today and as well what the, me the men involved in the production thought. And we realised that it, it happens an awful lot. And a lot of the time people don't speak up about it because they're scared of being seen to be making a fuss. A lot of people think that you should just let these things go and we came to the conclusion that you really shouldn't at all. Even with tiny things, like the with the FA ban and the things that Dick Kerr went through, that's obviously, that had a massive impact on a lot of people immediately. But these things do happen on a day-to-day -day basis, even if it's very small. And we do think that people should be speaking up for not just females, males, everyone should be speaking up for each other because the only way that any of this is going to get better is if people are persistent about saying no to it. So I think that is one of the main messages that the audience will go away with, hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah. Football and equality is what we're talking about in the studio here today. Should that yeah. just read equality full stop? I think it should, yes. I think it is a prime example of where we have needed equality in the past, but I do think that it is a general, with all, all walks of life, all types of work, how we just treat each other in general on the street. I think can, it's everything, yeah. Can feminists be football fans? Of course they can. Um, Feminists aren't just females. Feminists are any person who thinks that we should have equality. Mm. It's not raising up the female sex any higher than males. It's just an across the board equality for everyone and everyone having the same rights. So everyone can support football and everyone's allowed to not support football. <laughs> They see fit. Yeah. Does football, do you believe, uh, provide a good medium to highlight equality? I, I do think it does. I think that for a long time, female football especially was seen as a kind of novelty game compared to the male game. And I think that over the past couple of years, it has been growing and it's been gaining more status. I'm not sure that they'll ever be on a par now, but certainly we're seeing a lot more women being involved in football and as commentators, as managers. I'm not sure how long it would take to get equality there, but it's, it's certainly happening. Yeah. Can women play a role in mainstream football? Or should I just ask, do you, can you ever see a lady managing the Celtic senior team? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't see why not. I think it's totally dependent on the person. And you have to look at the ratio of men who support football and to women who support football. And eventually, I think there will be a woman who has the drive and the passion and wants to get to that place when we find them who knows 
it might be a while down the line. And obviously you're performing uh, in this play now, but what are your future plans? I have no idea at the minute. Just now I'm just enjoying doing this tour. It's wonderful. I've been working with some really amazing people and I love the company of the Fencer, a brilliant theatre company to work with. So hopefully I will work with them again at some point. I would really love that. Immediately after the tour, I will go back to Scotland and just enjoy the scenery and my family. And then I'll make plans when I need to. Rose, it's been amazing having you on the show today. Thank, Thank you very much. much for coming in. Thank you. Women's football matches once pulled bigger crowds than most men's games, sometimes even more than 50,000. In the 1920s, the sport flourished with around 150 teams operating in England. But then, as we have just discussed during the show today, the women's game was effectively banned with the FA at the time saying the game of football is quite unsuitable for females. It was another half century until women's football got back on its feet. And it's one of the key reasons why it lags behind the men's game today. I'll see you this time next week. Thanks for watching The Sports Show.